Good morning. Welcome to Salem. Hey, how are you? Okay. Good morning. <laughs> Enjoy your service. It's a place to hear from heaven. Welcome to Salem. We're so glad you're here. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. If anybody says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Simeon, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the four of the donkeys. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the tree and spread them on the road. Then the multitude that went before, and those who followed, cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee.
the Bible says where two or more are gathered in his name that he is in the midst. Anybody sense the Holy Spirit this morning? Won't you turn to your neighbor and say, good morning, it's good to see you. In fact, slap five people's hands and say, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord with you today. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. Because he's made it, we rejoice and we're glad in it. We greet each other in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those who are watching on TV, those who are watching online, we're glad you joined in with us. We want to invite you to invite somebody to sit with you or to share the link that they may watch it as well. Those who are in the room, welcome to church today. I want to invite everyone to stand as we go into our time of prayer. This prayer is different from the last week. Last week we read it together. This one is a call and response prayer. I will be praying my portion, and then you will pray the portion that says congregation and all. Thank you, Auntie Annie. Let's pray. God, we cry, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Today, we celebrate the triumphant entry of your son into Jerusalem, the world, and our own lives afresh. Father, you sacrificially sent your son, Jesus, to humbly ride into Jerusalem on a donkey for the feast of the Passover. And he rode as the crowd spread their cloaks on the path while others laid palms to prepare the way for his victorious coming. Father, we celebrate Christ's victories. We sorrowfully contemplate his sacrifice. We revel in his resurrection, the ultimate victory. Ride on, King Jesus. Ride on, conquering me. Father, we know Jesus came to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to grant the oppressed freedom. It is with, the, that's my part, minister. It is with extreme joy we welcome you into our lives, and with the thunderous Hosanna, we join you on your march toward liberation, justice, and love for all people. We receive these gifts and we praise you now in response as we travel on this road to resurrection. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name we pray, amen. amen. Won't you give God some praise? I want to invite you all to be seated and to turn your attention to the screen as we watch our announcement. I'm Jessica. Thank you for tuning into this week's announcements. We were so blessed this past Wednesday to hear from the Dr. Jamal Bryant, where he reminded us that our past does not define our future, and we are so special in God's eyes. We look forward this Wednesday to hearing from Dr. Danielle Brown. In our March to Hope project, where we collaborated with Progressive to adopt 20 schools from 35th to 115th Street, we were able to bless our educators and staff with breakfast on the 4th and lunch on the 11th, our teachers with school supplies on the 18th, 
and our students with goodie bags and Easter baskets with essentials. Salem, we could not have pulled this off without your labor of love and donations, your prayers and support for us, so we say thank you. Our pastor also wants to include a Teacher of the Year celebration on April 7th. Teachers from the 20 schools we have adopted have an opportunity to be Teacher of the Year. Our March to Hope concludes this week with the following activities all leading up to our big day. First, we will have our foot washing service right here at the House of Hope on Wednesday the 27th. Then we will have our outreach to the homeless population on Thursday the 28th at 10 a.m. Women at the Cross, um, which has an amazing lineup, will be on the 29th at noon. And that same day, we will have our joint service for Good Friday evening at Progressive at 7. We will also have a huge food box giveaway, including ham and chicken and other essential items in partnership with Salem and Withery Law on the 29th starting at 3 p.m. Our family fun fest, we can't forget about that, will be Saturday the 30th at noon right here at the House of Hope for All. This all leads up to our epic Easter morning service where we want you to invite everyone that you know. And have you seen our Who's the Goat billboard? Salem, we want to encourage you to invite all of your friends and family members to any or all of these activities. This concludes our announcements for today. I hope to share more of our upcoming activities with you soon. I am Jessica signing off.
We serve a great God, a mighty God, a great God, a mighty God. He won't do what early this morning. And you're in your right mind. Anybody believe that he's a great God? Just shout great, shout great. Clap your hands, give him glory. Clap your hands, give him praise. Go ahead, shout. Come on, bless him. Just shout great. Everybody, you see him. He's a great God. Go ahead, shout. Come on, great. A mighty God. The Prince of Peace. A way out of nowhere. Yes, he is. Just shout great. Anybody believe he's a great God? Just shout out great. Everybody, shout out great. Great God. Great God. Mighty God. I appreciate you. I love you. You're my Savior. My Redeemer. My Savior. My King. Shout great. Yes, he is. Anybody believe? Go ahead, bless him. Go ahead, bless him. Give him glory. Everybody, shout praise. He's a great God. He's a mighty God. He's a Prince of Peace. Emmanuel, my King of Peace, my Rose of Shame, the Great I Am. Whatever you need, you can't make me, make me doubt it. I know too much, too much about it. I got to praise him. Give him glory. Give him a
Is God gonna do it again? You believe that? I don't know how. I don't know when. And all that I know is God's gonna do it. Somebody say he's gonna do it. Shout real loud, say he's gonna do it. Say again, again, again. so good. Before we sit down, help me please, uh, because Pastor Meeks was given, our Pastor Emeritus was given an award this week. It was really great to have Pastor Meeks and Mrs. Meeks with us last week, wasn't it? Let's let them feel our excitement. We love you, Pastor and Mrs. Meeks, always thinking about you, grateful for you. Some big shoes in middle of this pulpit, I feel small. It just, I sink down to the bottom when I walk behind them. Uh, but this week, uh, Pastor John Hanna and the New Life Church gave an award to Pastor Meeks. And I want us, because today is New Life's 20th year anniversary, I want us to make some noise and to wave a happy anniversary to Pastor Hanna and the New Life. All right, y'all may be seated today. We that kind of church. Uh, we want to see every church open in the name of Jesus. Uh, thrive and succeed and so we are we're grateful for God's good grace there is Miss Darlene over there right, she in the back she'll come out today is Miss Darlene's 
24th birthday. I hear people yelling out the number. Y'all ain't going to get me. <laughs> you ain't going to get me to tell nobody's day. Miss Darlene, we met Miss Darlene uh, when we first came in 2006 as the inimitable director of the Women of Worship uh, Choir. And uh, Miss Darlene and that smooth voice and that kind of military cadence uh, would, would keep the choir in line. And so uh, there she is. Happy birthday, Miss Darlene. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, we're honored and thankful for your, to God for your life and your ministry. And then today is also uh, Deacon Gerald Baker's birthday, okay? <laughs> I don't know where he is, but I, I don't know. There he is, Deacon Baker's in the back. Wave your hand, Deacon Baker. People can see you even though you, it's dark, you light-skinned. We can spot you quite easily where you are. Uh, but I, I don't know of a more faithful servant who has uh, served our church and served Pastor Meeks uh, down through the years, and uh, and my, my fondest early memories of Deacon Baker, he had a little curl, it went a little long uh, down, and uh, and he'd have on these sweaters and stuff, and he'd stand there, you know, looking around, but he was really nice, you couldn't tell from looking at him, because he'd be standing looking at him, but he used to let the little kids uh, run up on Pastor Meeks, and, and I, I appreciate that to this day, and this church is made up of so many enormous personalities that have been incredible servants to the body of Christ and we ought to take a moment to thank God am I right for those that have served the long haul amen well thank you for being here this week Wednesday uh, Pastor Jamal Bryant was with us and uh, and blessed us on our road to resurrection now we slow down we slow down this is Holy Week Today is Palm Sunday. It's the week, as Pastor Meek said last week, it's the week that changed the world. And so today, uh, we look at a text of the triumphal entry of Jesus this week, Wednesday. Uh, I am asking all of our ministry servants, if you serve in a ministry, I need you especially to be here. Uh, Dr. Danielle Brown, from, who's the pastor of the Shiloh Church in Plainfield, New Jersey, Lord willing, will be our guest. It's kind of our prelude. Uh, to Women at the Cross on Friday. I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. Uh, but I, we are washing feet. Jesus washed his disciples' feet on Monday, Thursday. We're going to do that on Wednesday, and I will be part of the team doing that, but I would like it, if at all possible, if I could serve our ministry leaders uh, in that way. And so Wednesday is going to be a, a great time, and if you don't usually come on Wednesdays, uh, this is the week that deserves for you to come. Uh, on Wednesday. And then Friday morning uh, is Women at the Cross uh, right here. And did you want to say something about this? You don't? Okay. All right. I tried, y'all. But I, we don't need to let our First Lady stand by herself. We really want to uh, champion the continuing, continuance of this ministry. And some great preachers are coming. Uh, Kokisha Bailey, Robinson is going to be with us. Dr. Char Jenkins is going to be back with us. Dr. Nicole Massey Martin is going to be with us. Reverend Dr. Brianna Parker uh, is going to be with us. It's like the hip hop ballerina girls are going to be here. And Tina Campbell from Mary Mary will be with us uh, Friday as well. So uh, sisters, it's going to be great. Now, bros, you can show up. You can help us. You can stand out in the lobby and just be sure that the sisters are good. Stand around. And if you're single and you are ready to mingle and and you're looking for a woman who loves the Lord and uh, and you got your life together, you might want to come Friday too. You might want to come Friday too. Uh, so it's going to be an overabundance of grace here on Friday afternoon and you might as well enjoy some of it. And then Friday night, Friday night is our Good Friday service. Bishop Kenneth Omer all the way from Los Angeles, California will be our guest. Now that service is at Progressive and I'm asking you guys to join us. It starts at seven o'clock. As you know, Bishop Ulmer is like Pastor Meeks' favorite preacher. And so it's a, it's a high treat that uh, he would respond to my invitation. 
And, and if y'all don't show up, you'll be uh, making me look worse than I may already look uh, to some. But if you show up, then you will, you will send the strongest signal uh, that God is with us in great ways between pastor and people. Amen. Thank you for that. That was a sorry beginning to a sermon. Uh, turn, me, turn with me to Mark chapter 11. I want to uh, continue our path, our road to resurrection by looking at the triumphal entry of Jesus. I want to read into your hearing the first 10 verses, and then uh, I want you to turn over with me after that to Luke chapter 19, and I want to read verses 36 to 40, which overlaps, of course, in the synoptics as the same event. Uh, Mark chapter 11. When you got it, say, I got it. All right, this is how the Bible reads. It says, as they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage, and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one has ever set. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? You say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found a coat tied at the door outside in the street. And they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, what y'all doing? Untying the coat. They spoke to them just as Jesus had told them. And they gave them permission. It's one of the great lines in all of the Bible. They brought the coat to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Verse 36 says, as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Always church going people that got it. <laughs> Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. How, how does it say it in the King James? If these shall hold their peace, the rocks will cry out. We meet Jesus this morning on the road to the resurrection. On Palm Sunday, a high and exhilarating moment entering into Jerusalem for what will be a somber, stony week. Sometimes the highs and the lows go together, church. It's an interesting start, a kind of good day in a bad week. This week, as I've been looking through this, I've been listening to some theologians, they've been ministering to me all week, Frankie Beverly and Mays, and I don't know why this has just been stuck in my spirit, so you all pray for my salvation, my sanctification. I am saved, but pray for my sanctification, but I want to tag this text this morning, joy and pain, sunshine and rain, hallelujah. That's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about joy and pain, sunshine and rain. Will you breathe a word of prayer with me, please? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you with gratitude in our hearts, thanking you for another Sunday morning. I pray now that you would grant me clarity of mind, concision of speech, and conviction of heart. I pray that you help me today to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I know that you're able to save, you're mighty to save, to rescue, and to deliver. So I pray that you would do that today. No flesh will glory in your presence 
This is all for you and for your glory and for the good of your people. So make plain now the eternal mysteries of your word. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may behold wonderful truth in your word. And if I've asked you for too little, I pray you do something even bigger than what I just asked you for. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated and yet don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twist it by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop down and build them up with worn out tools. If you can talk with crowds and not lose the common touch or walk with kings and keep your virtue if neither friends nor foes can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, Kipling said, you'll be a man, my son. These words by Rutger Kipling bequeath to us the brightest insight of poetry on the competing forces of confusion in life. Sometimes life feels like you're in a vortex, a whirlwind of uncertainty, where the winds of life beat against you, and you doubt even yourself, your sense of purpose and direction. What Rutger Kipling was trying to do was to give us a philosophical and poetic grounding that would help us to keep our heads when all about us are losing theirs and blaming it on us. To, to be able to meet triumph and disaster, and in his words, to treat those two imposters just the same. I've sat down with my son Charlie from time to time to rehearse these words because I'm fascinated with people who can weather stormy spaces. People who can navigate the whirlwinds of confusion without losing their calm. I guess I've returned to these words again and again because well, I want to be that kind of person where the adverse winds of life do not throw me around, where the competing likes and dislikes of the public do not make me feel either real good or real bad about myself. Whether folks sing my praises or whether they hate me just the same, that I could be the kind of person that lives on mission and keeps clarity about my purpose. I want to be that kind of person. And I think that what Kipling gives to us in poetry, the peasant preacher from Galilee gives to us in real life demonstration. Jesus teaches us how to keep our calm when everybody around us is losing theirs. He helps us to keep our eyes focused on the mission, despite the confusion, maybe even for us, the confusion that rests on the inside. And I think even this day, Palm Sunday, around the world, demonstrates that Jesus is a living example of what it looks like to ascend and to experience turbulence as you ascend. Let me say it, by the way, in case there's somebody watching or listening to me in the room today in your 20s or 30s or somewhere, that the more you ascend, the more turbulent life will become. I know it's easy to think that with popularity comes good friends and good feelings. But the truth is, the more you are elevated, the higher you go, the sharper the aim of your haters become on you. And in this moment, we see Jesus handling the adverse winds that beat upon him. I had a living example of that this week. I was on a plane, fly quite a bit, maybe sometimes too much at times. And 
I have a rhythm. I, I'd like to stay to myself uh, when I'm flying by myself. I got on the plane, and I was sitting next to this brother. He was debonair. You could tell he was important. He was on the phone giving instructions back to his work. His laptop was open. He was cranking away, and he was so into his work that the flight attendants had to make him stow his laptop when they closed the door. He was somebody important. It was a good flight. He was calm, cool, and collected until... That plane started to rock and toss, bend one way, drop without notice. And there he went, grabbing hold to the side. I said, I heard a voice, be a Christian. I dare you. Well, I sat there and I looked at him till he looked over at me, teeth clenched. I, said, I hate this part. I said, what's wrong, man? He said, I don't know what's happening. He said, but you look so calm. I said, yeah, you'll be okay. Trust me, you'll be fine. He, he said, how, how could you be so calm? I said, I, I don't know. I said, turbulence is the price you pay for flying real high. It's, it comes along with the territory. You don't get this on the ground. It's, it's the competing winds in the air. And the plane is trying to find consistent wind beneath its wings. He, he said, do you fly planes? I said, no, I don't. He, he said, well, well, why are you so calm? I said, well, because the pilot's not panicking. And even though I don't know what he knows, if he ain't panicking, I'm going to fly like I know what he knows. And he looked at me, and I said, that's a lot like life. Jesus ain't panicking. And although I don't know everything that he knows, when life starts to... I just fly with him. I think that's an angle of vision that I should take on this text this week. That we see Jesus unfazed by the joy and the pain, by the sunshine and the rain, from fickle friends to frenemy betrayal to heartbreak in every way, his eyes are fixed on purpose. And the day will come where you too will face life when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. And you will need to know that just as Jesus could enter triumphantly into the week that held the worst news for him and the best news for us, you too can keep your calm. I like this picture of Jesus entering Jerusalem, headed past Bethany and Bethphage, two neighboring towns, Bethany, the house of dates, Bethphage, the house of figs. You look around, those ripened, ripened pieces of fruit are falling to the ground. People are chewing dates and spitting out the seeds and figs and going about their way. Matthew tells us it's a seismic crowd. That's literally the word he uses. It's, it's almost like an earthquake. It's so much energy because people are coming for Passover. And Passover is a theological reflection on the deliverance of God of his people when he passed over the blood-stained doorposts. But it is also a socio-political statement. And Jesus enters in in this arena, making both a theological and a socio-political statement that, that God is in favor of the liberation of his people, that he does favor that we be free, that we be free from all forms of sinful oppression. Not that we be free from him, but that we be free from the things that bind us from enjoying him. And here comes Jesus now. Walking into Jerusalem. Do you see him? Do you hear the little kids chattering and singing and making noise? Can't you feel the excitement as this peasant preacher from Galilee is kind of taking the countryside by storm? They're all watching him as he comes into Jerusalem. He knows what's about to happen. They don't. You can tell that he knows because much like a king, now Jesus orders a ride. 
See, the kings back in the day in the oriental manner would ride a steed. Jesus isn't just going to walk in. He's pronouncing who he is, but he does order a donkey. And we hear Jesus in Mark 11 like we haven't really heard him before in the Gospels. He's giving unusual instructions, hard directives. Go, and when you go into the city, you'll find a coat that's tied up. Untie it. And if anybody asks you, what are you doing? Tell them that the Lord hath need of it. Bring it to me and I'll get it back. It's the first time, by the way, we ever hear Jesus calling himself Lord. But I can tell that's lost on you. You see, some of the challenge of standing up and preaching today in 2024 is that people feel like they know this story so well that they miss the shock of what happens. And I just gave it to you. You were unmoved. Jesus says, go, you'll find a coat tied up, untie it, bring it to me. If anybody asks you, what are you doing? Tell them that the Lord hath need of it. I'll bring it back to him. It didn't work again. One more time. <laughs> Jesus says to them, go. And when you get there, you'll find a coat or be tied up. Break the lock off of the donkey don't ask anybody if you can take the donkey but if they ask you tell them that the Lord hath need of it and I'll give it back to them say for instance you were to go out to the church parking lot when church is over today and you saw somebody inside your car Jimmy and the lock on that Mercedes that you paid a note on, that you put gas in, and provided you were able to get it out of your mouth with clean words, you say to them, what are you doing? And they look back at you and say, the Lord. I figured you might be able to appreciate this. The Lord hath need of your car. You see how strange that sounds? It's as if Jesus is authorizing a donkey jacking that, that you can go take, find, as I say, and bring it back to me. But I think the deeper lesson here is not that Jesus is inspiring thievery. I think... It is that Jesus is demonstrating the fact that God will go before you and make unusual prior arrangements that you know nothing about so that when you get there, you'll find it the way he said it would be and you'll be able to accomplish the mission he sent you on. God reserves the right to send you and I on strange journeys with unusual instructions so that he can get us to accomplish what he wants for his glory. I'm preaching better than y'all talking back to me, but I'm gonna lean in for a moment to talk to somebody who's wondering why you are where you are, why you're living where you're living, why marriage is in the shape that it's in. Why are you still in Chicago? Why you got the co-workers you got? Why you're getting the reports that you're getting back? God reserves the right to send you on an unusual journey with unusual instructions so that if you but trust him when you get there it'll be the way he said it was going to be and you'll be able to accomplish what brings him glory. Friends, Jesus is not into sending his disciples off. Whenever Jesus sends his disciples and makes a predictive statement, it always turns out the way that he said it would turn out. I knew y'all would need me to prove this, so let me prove it. Jesus said in John 11, Lazarus is asleep, and we're going to wake him up. They said, well, if he's asleep... Shouldn't he sleep? No, Lazarus is dead. 
And I'm glad he's been dead so that y'all could see the glory and the power of God. We going to wake them up. So when they got there, the Bible says that Lazarus had been dead for more than three days. But Jesus opened his mouth and called Lazarus from the grave. And they found out that whatever Jesus says, even in an unusual circumstance, you're going to find out that Jesus ain't lied yet. One day, these disciples are on a stormy sea in Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 5, and Jesus says to them, come on, let's go over to the other side. They get in the boat, and the boat starts to rock and toss, and it looks like they're going to drown. But Jesus did not say to them, let's go die in the middle of the sea. Let's go get swallowed up by the watery grave. No, he said, let's go over to the other side. So when Jesus makes the winds and the waves be still, he shows that whatever he says to you, he reserves the right to send you on an unusual journey so that by the time you're done, you will find out he ain't lied. You still ain't with me. Jesus says to them, go make Passover preparations in Luke 22. He said it will be like this. And when they get to the upper room, they find everything just the way he told them. Peter, he says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. But I've already prayed for you, bruh, that when you come through, I need you to stand up and to strengthen your brothers. Don't you hear Peter saying, no, Lord, if I got to die with you, I'm going to die with you. But before the second and the third crowing, of that rooster. Peter denied Jesus three times and the Bible says that Jesus looked at Peter and Peter looked at Jesus and Peter found out that Jesus wasn't lying. Oh, but if you keep reading that story, somewhere in Acts chapter 2, that same Peter who had denied Jesus stands up and delivers the greatest sermon in the New Testament church and 3,000 people get saved because it doesn't matter what your failure is. If Jesus predicts your successful future you can go through whatever you're going through and he'll raise you up I wish I had somebody in here today I said I wish I had somebody in here today he said that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church in Matthew 16 and here we are 2,000 years later and Rome is gone and the power of Egypt is gone and the Greek civilizations are gone but we still talking about Jesus in church because the gates of hell still have not prevailed whatever Jesus tells you to do do it if he says go go if he says say it say it if he tells you to be still, be still. Because he is Lord of it all. I wish somebody heard me in here today. I said he is Lord of it all. The original language literally says, Jesus says, that if the Lord's lowercase of the donkey asks you, what are you doing? Tell them that the Lord, uppercase L, has need for it. I know that they think they own it, but that donkey really belonged to me. Everything in the world belongs to Jesus. Help me preach this in your house. I said the chair you sitting on belongs to Jesus. The ground that the house of hope is built on belongs to Jesus. The clothes on your back belong to Jesus. Come on, inhale with me. Exhale with me. That breath belongs to Jesus. Everything is under his rule and his domain. So why are you losing sleep at night? Worried about what people can do. Whatever anybody does to you, it is either God arranged or God allowed. And somewhere I read that God is able to make all things, the good and the bad, the ugly and the beautiful, the happy and the sad, he's able to make it all work together for your good. Look at Jesus in this strange parade. You hear these little kids singing at a parade. We know about parades. There was a big one last week. People outside getting drunk with no punishment. (laughs) 
shooting on the expressway in their Irish attire. Nobody's saying a word. We, we've seen parades, but this is a strange parade. This parade in Mark 11, instead of military pomp and circumstance, there are little children gathered around with branches of palm and willow and myrtle, landed down before Jesus singing, Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Strange parade, church. You got to be asking, who is this guy? That's what the Romans are thinking. Where did he come from? What are his credentials? There Jesus goes, riding on this donkey. That's not the way that they did it. You know, an oriental monarch would ride in on a stallion. They would put fine linen, bedazzled with jewels and diamonds, as a foal on the stallion. He would sit on diamonds and jewels. They would lay Persian rugs out before the stallion so that even the hoof of the stallion would step on the finest linen. Here now Jesus is with the used smelly coats of fishermen thrown on the back of an untamed donkey. You read that in your Bible like I did. That this is a donkey that no one has ever sat upon. This is an amazing portrait of the sovereign rule of Jesus. You don't ride untamed, unintelligent animals in a parade. I, the reason I know you don't do it is because I don't even like riding tame, intelligent horses in the open field. I know Murdoch and them, y'all get in, into it and all of that. I, I get it, that's great. But I didn't try it before. And I don't know if you've ever been on a weary, tired horse before. But it ain't the funnest thing in the world. Jesus gets on this wild, untamed beast of burden, rides it into the city, and the donkey does exactly what Jesus wants it to do. Because whatever Jesus sits on, however wild and untamed it has been, comes under the rulership and reign of his power, and it ends up falling in line in surrender. I, I thought y'all would understand what I'm getting at right now. This ain't the last wild thing Jesus done tamed. But I'm looking at some people in this room today who have lived a wild life. Oh, I wish y'all wouldn't treat me like that. Like we could put on the screen today your moments of indiscretion. We could show you driving out, tipping out of rooms that you did not belong in, getting home from happy hour or wherever you have been. But look at you now, sitting in church on a Sunday morning in Palm Sunday. How did you get here? I'll tell you how. Jesus is able to tame wild things. I just wish I had somebody in this room that wasn't too cute. You patty caking, but I'm explaining how you didn't made it in life. You didn't make it because your education refined you. You did not make it because your money got you through. You made it because while you were out there wilding out, he put a leash on your neck and drug you before you went too far. Is there anybody, maybe a thousand or two thousand of y'all, who could help me praise Jesus because you know you were wild? But he brought you back in. He's able to tame wild things. You see that donkey? Even unintelligent, untamed creation got enough sense to recognize he in charge. There he goes. I'm fascinated by this picture of Jesus riding on a lowly donkey. It's a pronouncement of his royalty. I just need to pause to say, I don't care what other people tell you now. Listen, and I'm saying this from the Bible. Jesus is king. Oh, yes, he is. I, I'm not going to chase that rabbit, but I just want to go on record pronouncing. He rules and reigns the world. And he didn't just become king in the Gospels. He was king back in Genesis when the worlds were framed through the word of God. He was king when that rugged Pharaoh looked at him and said, I'm not going to let your people go. And all of a sudden, locusts and bugs and flies came and the Nile River turned into blood.
He was king. That day when David looked at that giant and he said, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. He'd been king for a long time. Y'all remember, he was king in Isaiah. When Isaiah walked into that cloudy temple and he looked up and he saw the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah of God filling the temple and he fell down on his face. He was king when he told Jonah, Jonah go to Nineveh and Jonah booked a one-way ticket to Tarsus in the opposite direction and God ordered his Uber right there in the water, sent that fish and said, take him on back to Nineveh. He has been king all along, but y'all don't need me to run no Bible history lesson on y'all. You ought to know by now he's been king in your life too. I wish you heard me right there in section 108. I said, he been king in your life too. How do I know it? How do you explain food to eat every day? How, how do you explain a roof over your head? How do you explain going to bed at night in a wicked city and sleeping like a baby? He's king. This ought to make us, listen to me, this ought to make us want to worship him. This ought to make us want to be with the people of God on the weekend to honor him because you ain't never met nobody like him. You've never met anybody with power, real power, that's ever let you get this close to him. I know what I'm talking about. Kirsty and I were uh, standing outside of the Rayburn building in D.C. after Mr. Obama had been inaugurated and like many of you, we saw that motorcade go by. Woo. Beast is what they called that car. It's like 15 cars. And cars, the suburbs in the front, suburbs in the back, the windows are out. And they got automatic weapons pointed at you. As if to say, <laughs> try if you want to. Today ain't going to be your day. If I wanted to, I could not just walk up. Hey, 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 Mr. Obama, good to see you, man. Can I? No. Because all we know in human power is to threaten others with the ammunition that we have. You, you cannot just walk into Jeff Bezos' office or Mr. Gates or Mr. Buffett it, because it's too much. They have too much to let you get close. But look at this beautiful picture in Mark 11 where the kids are walking right up to him. Immediate access, approachable. And you too have never had a moment in your life where he was playing hide and go seek with you. You've never had a moment where he hung out a shingle and said, I'm busy, I'll be right back. But every time you've ever fallen to your knees to call upon his name, to seek him for whatever you need. He has always given you a listen. As soon as you called his name, he was right there. Here comes Jesus. Don't you see him? You see all of these children, all of these people riding through, singing, and oh, they are singing. Can't you hear them as they sing? Hosanna! <laughs> That's a good word. Hosanna! But blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. There he is riding on that beast of burden, coming to actually lift our burdens off of our shoulders. Hosanna! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Every king has taxed them, but he's not taxing them. It's a beautiful word. Hosanna! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. You know what Hosanna means, right? It, it means save now. That's precisely what Jesus would not do. See, because the world will take a Messiah when he comes in power. When he displays himself in all of this might. That's the kind of leader that the world wants. The world wants somebody who's going to come in and just sit down with all of the authority and the power. But God likes to come at us in subversive, strange ways. He doesn't come in that kind of power. He knows, he knows that he's going to save, but not riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. No, no. He's going to save. 
Not looking like somebody elite, high and mighty and powerful. He's going to save looking weak. This is the beauty, friends, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he who had all power came down and laid all that power to the side. That, that he who could rule and reign and could, in his sovereignty smash us actually came to lift us. And if you're listening to me here today, part of the unusual instructions that Jesus gives to you is, is that you got to believe that Jesus is the Christ. It, it's unusual. You could be like Bill Mayer and so many others who go, I, I don't understand how another human being could take the penalty for sin that I committed, for wrong that I did. But there's only one way, really, to get saved. There's only one way to, to do it. it. It is this. He came from way up there to way down here. And all you and I have to do is believe. Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That would be one thing if that's how the story ended. He is the Savior. He is the ruler. But that's not how this story ends. No, it turns out that the religious people are upset with the kids singing. Because you know that's how religious people can be. They ain't got a shout in them. So they want to judge everybody else's shout that comes out. It don't take all of that is what they come say to Jesus. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd, the Bible says, said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Uh, tell them that they shouldn't be making all of this noise. Now, now, I'm preaching this to a bunch of people who would never admit that this is how they feel. And, and I'm not stoking you or priming you or prodding you, but I am saying that there is instruction in this text as to why these people were saying and singing what they were singing. The Bible says in verse 37 of Luke 19 that as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a quiet voice. No, that ain't what the text says. It was with a loud voice. Here it is. For all of the miracles which they had seen, shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, praise may feel emotive, but it starts off cognitive. For everybody who thinks that folk who praise are emotional chumps, are spiritual weaklings who have no other real strength upon which to stand, and so they just open their mouths like they have no real intellect, let me tell you, you've missed the boat. Because the people who shout the most are the people who have seen God do the most. In other words, if you ain't never seen God do nothing, don't say nothing. But I feel like I'm at the airport. If you see something, say something. The reason I throw my hands up in the air and I'm liable to run a lap, it's because I've seen God do too much. And with everything that God has ever done for Charlie Dates, forgive me if I act a fool in front of you. I wish I had somebody else in this room with me here today. This is why they used to say, when I think of the goodness of Jesus the Christ. And not some of the things, but all of the things he's done for me, my soul. Can we pause for station identification? just for a moment. I mean, this ain't for me, but I'm talking to some people who are blood bought, fire baptized, redeemed, that the Lord has brought you through some things. Anybody here ever been saved, rescued or delivered, can you shout? I mean, if you got a good memory, listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says, hey, guys, I would do that. But if these should hold their peace, 
in, in other words, it's my preference, but it ain't necessary. If these should hold their peace, the rocks will grow lips. And inanimate creation will start to move to shout out the praise of God. I wonder, is there anybody here who feels like I feel? In the church I grew up in, they would say, I don't want no rocks crying out for me. He's been too good to me, y'all. He, he gave me a voice. I don't need you to shout for me, and I don't need no rock to shout for me. I can shout for my doggone self because he's been that good. I, I'm here today to tell you, Palm Sunday is Praise Sunday. And we ought to be the kind of people who are so grateful for every time he woke us up. For every mountain he saw us over. For every meal he kept on the table. For every time he got the kids safely back home. For every door he has opened. We ought to be able to say. Oh, but y'all do know that rocks talk. <laughs> I know what I'm about to say. You might not get happy, but I'm happy already. Rocks do talk. There are rocks throughout the Bible that talk. That rock Moses struck when he was supposed to talk to it. Showed that God got all kind of power in his hands. Rocks do talk. You, you know that rock that Jacob laid his head on that night. It, and he, he found out that God, when you're running, will let you win and lose at the same time. That he will lift you up. Oh, but there's another rock that's about to talk in a few days. And in case I don't get back to tell you personally about that rock that talks in a few days, let me tell you about that rock. It's a rock called a grave. It's undefeated. And they put the dead in the grave. The problem is, is that they put our rock in the rock. Because the Bible says that he is the rock of our salvation. He is the rock that said upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So they took our rock and put our rock in the rock and our rock stayed in the rock all night Friday and our rock stayed in the rock all day Saturday. Oh don't get tired of me yet Salem. Our rock stayed in that rock all night Saturday night. But rocks do talk. And early Sunday morning, our rock got up with all power in his hands. Power to heal the sick. Power to raise the dead. Power to lift the lowly. And so now I've decided I'm not going to let no other rock shout for me. Because my rock has been too good to me. He gave me a voice. So I'm going to use it. He gave me hands. So I'm going to use them too. He gave me legs. And I'm going to walk all over. Telling everybody how good God is. He gave me eyes to see. So I could tell somebody how God looks at them. And if I'm not by myself. If there's anybody in the room that says God has been too good. You ought to help me by lifting your voice. And tell them thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I don't know what else to say. If I knew how to speak in other languages, I would do it. But all I got is thanks. Glory to your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Isn't he good, church? Isn't he good? I mean, no, isn't he better than good? You and I see our king triumphant and eternal. Who came to see about us, lifting us, securing us, and keeping us. If you're not standing, would you stand up on your feet? If you can, if your knees work. Here is the God who reserves the right to send you 
on an unusual journey with unusual instructions because he came from way up there in an unusual way to way down here to rescue, save, heal, and deliver. And because he did it, I'm going to raise my voice every chance I get. I'll do it while I'm in church. I'll do it while I'm in the car. I'll do it while I'm at home. I'll do it in the boardroom. Because I ain't ashamed to own them. Did you hear me in here? I said I ain't ashamed to own them. I know people are ashamed. I know people, they, they, you got to be dignified and sedity and well put together. I get the feeling that I would be lost without a clear sense of meaning and purpose in the world. Floating by, tossed and driven by the winds of life. Had he not saved me. And so I've decided I'm going to own him. Every chance I get, I'm going to say he is mine and I am his. And maybe there's somebody here today. Somebody slipped into the fellowship today that the Lord has brought you in because he wants you to see that he has made prior arrangements in your life to get you right here. The, the question is, will you obey these unusual instructions? I've been praying for you that you would. I want to give it to you now. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you with gratitude in our hearts, grateful for your power and presence. I'm asking now that you will, by your grace and your mercy, save somebody, rescue, heal, deliver. And then, Lord, I pray that you will not only rescue, heal, and deliver, I pray that you'll draw people into fellowship with your church today. I know that you can do even more than what I just asked you for, so... May it please you to do that for your glory and for our good. I plead with you. And I bless you for it. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If you're here today and you're not 100% sure that you're going to heaven when you die, will you raise your hand? You say, I want to go to heaven. I really do. I hope I'm going. But I don't know. Raise it high. I want to tell you. I want to tell you that you can be sure. There's another group, leave, it, leave them raised. Those of you who say, I want the abundant life on earth too. I don't want to just wait till I get to heaven to feel the joy of God. I need it here on earth. Would you raise your hand if that's you? You say, I, I need the abundant life here today. Jesus says he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, I have come that they might have life. That's you. And the only way to get Jesus, the Bible says, is to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you will be saved. My sister, my brother, wherever you stand, if that's you, you, you know that you need Jesus. You want to go to heaven when you die. Will you pray this prayer after me? You have to mean it. Will you pray it after me? Pray, dear God, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, that he died on the cross for my sin. I believe you raised him from the dead. I ask you to save me so that when I die, I'll go to heaven. And while I live, I'll enjoy the abundant life. If you prayed that prayer while no one else is looking but me, will you throw your hand up in the air? Throw it up high. I want to see you. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Leave it raised. Leave it raised. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? I see you too. I'm so thankful for you. I know God is true to his word. He's faithful and honorable. You may lower your hands. Every head is still bowed. Every eye is still closed. If you're here today and you're not a member of a church, would you be honest and raise your hand? Say, I, maybe I used to go to church, but I don't anymore. There you go. Leave it raised, my brother. Leave it raised, my sister. Wherever you are, God is calling you. God wants you. Leave it raised. I want to pray for you. Now, I just got through telling you that God will make prior arrangements, unusual 
setups in your life. But you got to be willing to obey his instructions. So I'm going to pray for you. And when I get done praying, I'm going to count to the number three. And if I pray for you because you need a church or if you prayed that prayer, I want you to obey the instructions and to come to Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see the hands and the hearts that are raised. People who need a church. Some of them are sitting up at the top. Some are sitting in the middle and some even on the floor. They may feel like it's a long walk. I just pray that you give them the freedom now to trust you to get out of that row, out of that seat and come this way. I know that you're able to do it. So would you do it for your glory, your glory alone and for their good and our good. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Everybody's looking this way. You raise your hand. and You're up there or around here, wherever you are. You prayed that prayer. You're not too far. I'm going to count to the number three. I want you to leave your seat and to come this way. By coming this way, you'll be saying God is in charge and I trust him with my life. Here we go. If that's you, when I get to the number three, it's you. One in the name of the Father, two in the name of his Son, three in the name of the Holy Spirit. Come on, my brother. Don't sit down. Come on right now. You know who you are. Take that step. Take that walk. There you go. Come on. Come on, bro. Take that walk. Come on, my sister, wherever you are. Give God your life today. You know where you are. You know who you are. God is moving. God is at work. Hallelujah, yes. Glory to his name. There you go. There you go. Don't sit down. Give God a chance. Whoever you are, wherever you are. Give myself away. So you can do Give myself away. So you can do Here I am. Here I stand. Lord, my life, even your hand, Lord, I'm lost, longing to see your desire. So I need some help. There are so many people today, just believe me when I tell you, who raise their hands and they are still sitting where they're sitting. They got to make a decision. It's on them. It's not on you. It's not on me. But I do need you to help me, Salem. Will you please muster up all of the sweetness and goodness that you have and look at somebody, even if they're, especially if they're sitting on the road by themselves behind you or in front of you on the side, and just say, hey, I'd love to walk with you today. Let me, if today's your day, tell them I'll walk with you. Go for it right now. You know what to do, Salem. Hallelujah. There you go. There you go. Trust the Lord today. There you go. There you go, too. That's what I'm talking about. It's the best. It's the best decision you can make. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to his name. There you go. Hallelujah. just gotta ask is there anybody else that wants to experience the love of Jesus 
and the fullness of his presence. I can't make you come. I would sing you into heaven if I could. But I tell you what, I'd rather beg you to come right now. I'd rather beg you to come right now than to just let you walk out of the door. So we're going to sing this one more time. And I'm asking you, if that's you, let somebody walk with you. God has given you just a few more moments. All right, here we go. I give myself, I give myself, to you. My life is not my own. My life is not my own. Come on, say to you, I belong. Salem, let's thank God for those who have come today. I mean, no, really, let's put our hands together in thanksgiving to God. I hope y'all don't ever get tired of seeing this, that God is a save, saving God, a delivering God. Those of you who come today, we thank the Lord for you. We don't know all of what God is up to in your life, but we do know this. He's up to something special. He loves you. Come on, come on, come on. He loves you, cares deeply for you. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. If you have never been baptized, to be baptized is to be taken down into the water in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. If that's never happened to you, will you raise your hand? God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. The rest of you have been baptized. We thank God for you. Whosoever will, church. One more time. Whosoever will, let them come. come. I need y'all to follow this sister right here. Thank you. With the palms, will you give us five minutes with you to explain the decision you've made? Church, let's celebrate them. I give myself. I give myself. Give my, I give myself to you. To you. Everybody say my life, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself. Give myself. All right, let us prepare to give to the Lord. If you need an envelope in which to give your offering, won't you raise your hand and we can give one passed down to you. I don't want to remind and encourage you. Please grab a red envelope. This is how we say to our pastor, we love you. As you listen to his sermon today, there were a lot of jewels that he brought to you. Some of it, some stuff you probably ain't never seen before. It takes work and labor, and our pastor loves us to labor in God's word and in his presence for us. And part of how we say thank you and we love you is by giving to him. And the Bible says that the one who labors in the word is worthy of double portion. And we wanna say we love our pastor, amen? amen. There are other ways that you can give on screen. Those of you who don't get red envelopes, there's still a way for you to give that way as we give to the Lord. We have our giving litany. Won't you hold what you're giving to the Lord in the air? And let's pray this together. Like the psalmist before us, we ask, what shall we render to you, Lord? 
for all your benefits towards us. Today, we raise the coin and the cup of salvation, praising your name for saving us and keeping our promise to give generously to you and your kingdom work. Already, you, you have kept us into the third month of the year, and already you have supplied all of our needs according to your riches and glory. Already you have done exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think, and you are not done yet. You are not done blessing us. You are not done healing us. You are not done saving, restoring, and redeeming us. And as we give today, our eyes are on you. We have seen you do too much to doubt your goodness right now. We have heard too much to pretend like you are not true to your word. So please receive these gifts and keep on doing what you do. Be God sovereign and supreme in our finances with our families and over our future and if we have asked you for too little do something even bigger than we just asked you in Jesus' name amen 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 give god a hand of praise you can pass your offering down as we're passing our offering we are excited about the Dates Fellowship Residency program. This is a program that we are designing. Our pastor has a desire to be able to pour into future preachers, in the developing of pastors, but also thinking about black sacred music and developing people who can sing for our churches and to strengthen the music ministries in our churches. And we have created a residency program where we're taking five or four, Thank you. Four seminary students that are going to come here and serve at Salem and at Progressive. And those applications are now live on Salem's website, and they will remain open until April 12th. Now, this is for seminary students. So if you're listening and you're a seminary student on your way out, and you're like, I feel like God has called me to ministry, go ahead and get that application, and you can go ahead and start to fill it out. Also, we have decided to postpone our Daughters of Eden trip. We have a new date that is pending. I know you've been asking about it, but a new date is pending, and we will get that date to you in short order. Amen? I praise God for Pastor Leslie and all that she is still. Yes, give God a hand of praise for her. And all that she is doing in the pastoral care department, she is really killing it and rocking it. She and her team are doing some amazing things. I want to direct your eyes to the screen for just a moment as we take a moment to reflect on our family members, our members who have gone on to be with Jesus. To all our family members who have lost loved ones, we want you to know we are praying with you, we are praying for you, we are here to serve you. You do not have to walk this journey alone because if you look around, you see brothers and sisters who are here with you on this journey. And the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. We have a Jesus who understands what it means to grieve 
and we have a Lord and Savior who is there to comfort us in our time of need. Amen. At this time, we looked at death, and now we celebrate life. We have three babies to dedicate, and I want to give a moment to allow families to come up with their babies. Those of you who have babies to dedicate, won't you make your way forward? really excited today. We have Sailor Vasquez, Anise Rogers, and Jeffrey Scott. Jeffrey's parents joined the church today. Oh, here they are. They're running up now. You can take your time. You ain't got to run. I don't want you to get winded. This is a high point because the Bible tells us that children are an inheritance from the Lord. In fact, those of you, those of you got the babies, can y'all step a little further? There's some with babies that are standing back. Let me see you. Just step a little closer. There you go. Oh. The Bible tells us that children are an inheritance from the Lord. God is kind enough, gracious to us to give them to us, not just as arm pieces, though they are some pretty arm pieces. But God entrusts children to us to shape them, to raise them, to not just be church people, but to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to walk with him. So parents, I want to ask you a question. Oh. <laughs> you want to come up here? She was kicking like she wanted to come up here. So here, here you are. You're here now. You're here now. So parents, let me ask you this question. Do you plan to do everything within your power to make sure your children know who Jesus Christ is? Do you plan to do everything to teach your children to know and love the Lord, to walk with Jesus, to obey him in all things? All right. This is your village here. Parents and godparents, siblings. Do you plan to do everything you can to stand around these parents to help them to do what God has called them to do in their lives? Oh. Yes. All right. Now, y'all got a larger village behind you, the Salem Baptist Church of Chicago. Salem, do you plan to do everything in your power to come around these families and other families to come to say, I want to help you do what God has called you to do. You want my mic? Well, amen. Will you extend your hands forward as we pray for these children? Father, we thank you so much for the gift that you have given these parents. God, we thank you for the gift that you have given to us through these children. 
Now, Father, I pray that you would stand around these parents. Give them strength. Give them grace. God, give them wisdom to make the right decisions. God, sometimes we stand with our children, especially as they get older, and we don't know what to do. But I pray in those moments your spirit would whisper words to us. I pray, Lord, that when these parents feel overwhelmed, that family members, grandparents, aunties, uncles would step in to help these parents do what it is you've called them to do. And now, God, we raise these children up to you. We give them to you. You gave them to us, and now we're giving them back to you to say, Lord, use them as you see fit. God, we might be holding future presidents, future doctors, future lawyers, future pastors, future preachers. Lord, let your spirit descend upon them. God, we give your name praise and we give your name glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I think I'm holding a future preacher. We got something we want to give you that we'll give to you after service. Let's stand up on our feet together. Thank you, Pastor Watson. Is Mother Sims here? Yes, right. Wave at me. We're so happy to see you. It's the first time seeing Mother Sims in a number of months. She's come through procedure. And uh, saying, I see you, Sharon. Good to see you, too. Yeah, I saw. I saw. Yeah, yeah. And the grandbaby came today. Listen, Salem, I think that our great God, on the strength of his word, wants to do something unusual and extraordinary in your life, in mine, and therefore in our fellowship. In other words, I'm not just preaching sermons to make you and I feel a certain way. I believe that word is living. It is active. And I, I think that in the same way that Jesus prevailed in a wonderful manner with his disciples, he wants to do the same in your life and in my life this week. I just pray you and I will be open to it, that we'll receive it in the fullness thereof. Dr. Grooms, uh, am I supposed to make an announcement about... Uh, reception or whatever or is it everything squared away everything is squared away we're giving away hams this week you've heard all of that all of our uh, Easter meals on Friday here at the House of Hope it's after women at the cross and uh, listen teacher appreciation Sunday is gonna be the Sunday after Easter the first Sunday in April and so it's our effort to take a bit of what God has blessed us with and to sow it into our community. We're blessing teachers in low-income neighborhoods. We've been doing that all the way through. And so uh, I'm urging you, be here, be here, be here. And then, of course, the first Sunday in April, we kick off our Defining Decade Series 2.0 uh, for you 20s and 30-somethings. Uh, just, just be there. Look at me. Let me bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Cause His face to shine upon you. Give you His peace and be gracious to you may the lord lift the light of his countenance upon you may he cause you to rejoice in your labor and in your leisure in your laughter and in your tears when the sun rises early and when it settles down late may you feel the joy of his spirit as you pull out of the parking lot not be tempted to cuss nobody out on your way home but instead tomorrow as he wakes you if it be his will may you enjoy the fact that God reserves the right to send you on an unusual journey to bless your life. To him be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. Don't come to church by yourself next week. Bring somebody. Say amen. Amen. Love y'all.
right, good afternoon, Salem. Happy Palm Sunday. I'm Lorenzo. I got my good brother here. Johnny, what's going on, family? Cool, cool. All right, uh, let's just jump straight into it. Uh, what do you think about service today? What's something that's you know, standing out? Immediately, I woke up today, and I, I felt this sense of excitement. I text you. I text the others as well, and I let you guys know that I appreciate you guys. And I know I'm getting old because when I was younger, I wasn't really looking forward to church. But now I get excited to come, and especially during this time of year where we have this reverence and this reflection on Jesus Christ and his work. So for it to be Palm Sunday, and of course, Charlie Dates delivers a powerful, powerful message. For sure. Yeah, and I think one thing that I appreciated about this sermon specifically, I feel like, you know, Holy Week, Palm Sunday, um, we've done it, a lot of us have done it since we were kids. Um, so now it's looking at it through a new lens, not getting comfortable with the stories, you know, uh, still trying to extract, like, one thing that I appreciated, he said it's it's Palm Sunday, but it's also Praise Sunday. You yes. know, how they were praising Jesus as he entered into the uh, the village and, it, it kind of shook me up like how is my praise am i getting comfortable with you know the blessings that i've received like am i giving god his just due and his admiration etc so i appreciated that part absolutely about a too. praise check a heart check to make sure that we are appreciative but also the brothers and sisters around us who have something to give to god they got they we owe god that praise and for us to look at them some kind of way as if you know, we don't know their story. So mm -hmm. we have to be able to celebrate our brothers and sisters that's also praising God. Sure. So that, that struck me personally because I tend to sometimes, you know, reclude sometimes and close mm. off, but I got to be open and, and not only praising for myself, but appreciate the stories that my brothers and sisters have and their testimonies as well. Sure. Yeah. So it was a blessing overall. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think another part that I enjoyed about service was um, when he talked about being called to peculiar missions or what have you for God and yes. trusting that, you know, it might not look how uh, how we want it to look or, you know, whatever the mission may be, but trusting that God has me in this space for a purpose and for intention. I just need to trust him and uh, just give it all to him. I love how Charlie Dates uh, uh, made it a point to say that the reason it's unusual a lot of times is the point of faith. If it made sense, where would our faith play sure. in the role? So. I think the beauty in it is the fact that he tells the disciples, hey, we have to go to the boat, but obviously they have to get over the water. He's not going to tell you all the ins and outs and all the details, yeah, right. right? It's just this is, the, this is the destination. And as he said, I wrote it down because it meant so much at the time. He said, whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. It's just do that it. plain and simple. Yeah, so right it's, it's so impactful. We got a few announcements. Uh, what's coming up here at Salem? Absolutely. So we do have... The first thing that's coming up is the homeless outreach on the 28th. So we want to know about that. We have women at the cross, which they've been playing that up a right. whole lot. I'm um, excited for the women. You guys are going to be coming Ooh, here women. at Salem on the 29th. <laughs> the 29th. And then on that same day, that evening, is the Good Friday uh, service. And that's going to be at Progressive. Progressive, correct. Yep. So that's going to be coming up real soon. And then... On the 31st, we have our Easter Sunday service. Yes. Everybody is in charge of bringing minimum one other person. Charlie Dates wants. I'm always looking over at this side of the of the building. There's no seats being taken over there. I want to see the whole entire place. <laughs> Charlie Dates wants to see the whole entire place filled out. So everybody's in charge of bringing at least one person. And then we have April 7th, the teacher appreciation event that's going to be taking place. And then after that, we are going to have our Define a Decades 20s and 30s. You guys come in Beautifully on, said. I think that's that's on the 7th. I want to say it's a Sunday after Easter. Sunday, oh, Sunday after Easter. So yes, that's right. That's going to be on the uh, following Sunday. And that's going to be in the evening. Uh, and that's going to be for the young adults. So I'm excited for that. That's how well, I found said. Salem. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Salem. Absolutely. Well, that's it. Again, my name is Lorenzo. My name is Johnny. All right, y'all have a blessed week. God bless.